Hello, hello, good evening. I am so happy to be with you all this evening discussing this topic that, again, like every single week, this is actually week 11 that I've been live. So every week I'm going to try to come live for you. And hopefully it's doing something and helping you improve in some way, shape or form. But the more that I go live, the more of you I get to interact with, the more questions, comments and things, and it inspires other lives. So this live tonight is for all of you who may have felt that like lack of confidence about presenting myofunctional therapy or talking about it, whether you are just referring. Some people have said, oh, we're doing the broom screening and we're trying to talk about it, but it doesn't seem like it's getting anywhere. Or I'm a myofunctional therapist and I'm struggling to figure out how to get all my patients to really get on board. It's okay. This is perfect for you, okay? If you struggle to ever talk about myofunctional therapy, uh, there's some very key reasons why you're struggling, and we are going to work you all the way through it, okay? So give me a good, like, hi. I never really know if this is, like, streaming well or if it's lagging or, like, if anything is good. So just let me know that we're all good. You can hear me, you can see me, and that we are good to go. And once we're good to go and I get, like, a quick hello, I can hear you then I will happily start. Uh, but I really do want to welcome you all. I appreciate everyone for being here live. And those of you who are watching the replay, you know, feel free to comment as well. Some of this will be interactive. Awesome. Great. I'm getting, I can hear you. Hello. How is everybody? Good. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Anybody recognize this guy, this face? You might not recognize the guy. I don't know. He's a stock photo guy. Maybe you recognize him for some other work that he may have done portrait wise, but that like turned off like, uh, -uh like I don't want to hear all of that mumbo jumbo, whatever the heck you're talking about. This guy it looks like a lot of your patients sometimes. You're talking about myofunctional therapy and they're like myofascial what? Myofun what? Oh my, what? <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about. They've never heard of myofunctional therapy before. If they have, they associate it with something like outlandish. There are people who have gotten a lot of education about it and still are kind of like, eh, I don't really think I want to do all of that right now. I don't know that I believe in it. There are even some who are educated professionals. So I've had professionals who are like speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, doctors, like MDs, a couple of DOs, people who have looked at me with that kind of like, what is she talking about kind of look as I talk to them about myofunctional therapy. I get it. I get it. It is a little bit out there, right? We just got to admit it. We're talking about changing the quality of your life based upon how you're using your muscles below your eyes, but above your shoulders, like from here to here. It does sound like a bunch of hogwash. It sounds like a bunch of like, what? What are we talking about? So sometimes you'll get that. By the end of this, hopefully you'll know how to turn a lot of that around. Uh, particularly with your dental patients or people who are in the op that you're talking to from a clinical perspective where you have like a different view. I feel like when you're speaking about Mayo and you're trying to sell Mayo, you're talking more peer to peer. You're talking more, I am a person, you're a person, we're connecting on this thing. Whereas with dentistry, there's a little bit of a, you know, superior, like I'm talking to you to educate you, you need to do this, you have to do that, and da 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 da, where it becomes a little bit more of your instructions as opposed to you selling that way. So I actually want to step right into that, where we talk about the first big myth that is very prevalent that selling myo is just like selling dentistry. Like if I'm good at selling dentistry, I should be good at selling myo. If I can get my patient to go to the endodontist and they hate root canals, I can get anybody to go to the myofunctional therapist, right? Wrong. Absolutely wrong. It is entirely different to talk about these two things. Dentistry people are already relatively familiar with what's going on in dentistry. They know why they came there. They anticipate to some degree 
that something might be wrong. I mean, and the high levels of anxiety that exist in the world today, I'll tell you that my brother, my oldest brother tells me like he doesn't go to the doctor because he doesn't want to hear that something is wrong, right? So he doesn't go to his primary care physician because he's just scared something's going to be wrong. You're like anticipating it. So it's like the other shoe has dropped when you do get to the doctor or you get to the dentist and you're like, oh, I have a cavity. I just knew that was going to happen. And they were just ready for for it, right? But who is ready to hear that their tongue is not where it's supposed to be? Who's ready to hear that they are not breathing properly? Who is ready to hear that, you know, everything they thought they knew about the quality of their sleep, the quality of their breathing, the quality of their eating, their digestion, after they've been seeing specialists, after they've been seeing people all their lives, they've been consistent, some of them, with their primary care physicians, who's ready to get to the dentist and hear about their sleep, their digestion? their breathing, their tongue posture, not a soul. Nobody cares. Nobody is interested in hearing about that. They weren't prepared for that. So that's already going to put up a block that puts up a block. It puts up a wall and nope, sorry, I don't want to hear it. I I've got no room for that kind of, you know, stuff in my life. I've got no room for it in my budget. And it just sounds like you're trying to sell me some extra stuff and nobody likes that. Right. Because we're healthcare professionals. We shouldn't be selling, right? We're healthcare professionals. No, you're a healthcare professional who on the daily, multiple times a day, probably in ways you don't even know, are selling something, okay? So a lot of times you're selling just yourself and your confidence in yourself and what you know and your knowledge in things. You're selling yourself as the professional who understands that if they would like their perio to stop, they're going to have to invest in a water flosser or whatever. You you are selling them something. So even if you're in forming them of something, you are selling them on the idea that they need to make a change, that they need a lifestyle change. So selling is always happening, but selling Mayo is nothing like selling dentistry at all. Hey, Roxanne. Okay. So when it comes to selling overall, stop thinking about it as a bad thing. It is happening all the time, all the time. I can't stand it. I am so numb to it. And part of how this whole thing came about is the fact that, you know, I'm one of those people that's resistant to a sales tactic. I understand what sales tactics are. If you try to hard sell me something, I'm probably going to push back in some way, shape or form. And I probably won't buy from you because you're coming at it too hard. I have ads in my face all day. There are billboards all over the place and I'm in my car a lot and there's billboards. I'm listening to podcasts and there's randomly, they're dropping in ads there. Prime video is really upsetting me now because it's an extra extra $2.99 a month if I don't want ads on Prime Video? Like, where did that come from? I don't watch commercials. We pay extra for Hulu, so I don't have to do that. I pay extra for YouTube, so I don't have to do that. And now it's like more and more and more ads in your face all the time. Who here has actually ever been talking about something around in the proximity of their smartphone and then naturally had that product now advertised to them as they're scrolling through their feeds. I have, my husband and I once talked about how the kids keep chipping off the paint and neither of us had looked at paint at all ever. We're talking about how the kids are chipping off the paint off the walls. This is years ago before, you know, it's gotten much worse now. But next thing you know, he's scrolling through social media. He says, are you seeing ads for paint? Because I'm seeing ads for paint. And I said, absolutely, I'm seeing ads for paint. That's crazy because I didn't look up any paint. You didn't look up any paint. We were just talking about how we might need to repaint. And that is how prevalent sales are. Sales are just happening to us. We're overwhelmed. And we're also in a time and you know place where we're all pretty frustrated by the high cost of absolutely everything. I go to the grocery store. Store. We had a uh, hand basket. We put like five products. I swear it was five things in that basket uh, just to make like two nights of dinner or something like that. And the bill was over $50. And I was like, what? Like, why? Why? I don't understand. A lot of these things used to cost significantly less. So now when you're looking at your budget and you're looking at what things you're going to expense, um, expense on your monthly, you know, budgeting, you're 
probably not planning for a random therapy that you had never heard about. Like you might have money and savings. Absolutely. And then you think to yourself, well, you know, if things keep going the way great they are, I might need to start dipping into that savings. So your savings might already have itself written aside for something else, for the off chance that this inflation thing goes even higher. So if we're putting ourselves realistically in our patient's shoes, they come to the dentist, they don't anticipate hearing about anything other than potentially something going on as far as a cavity or they need to brush better or we need to floss more. You're not going there really as a healthy individual anticipating that now you're going to be talked into buying some couple thousand dollars worth of myofunctional therapy that you've never heard of, you don't understand why you need, and you're probably going to laugh about it with your partner when you get back home. You might not laugh in front of your practitioner, but you will when you get back home, okay? So we have to consider and keep all of that at the forefront of our mind because these patients are just like us and you do not want to count anybody's pocket. You don't want to say, okay, well, I don't think this one could afford it or that one could afford it. You never know what people can afford. And granted, when people are really motivated, they're going to find ways to afford or budget in things that they do want. However, nobody at the offset has any interest in just blindly accepting myofunctional therapy. There is a learning curve, number one, but that learning curve, oh, there's so much to talk to you about. Okay, let me slow myself down a little bit, okay? Let's start first off by talking about the metrics of it all because a lot of you are gonna want to start to understand, well, what's my closing rate or how often am I able to convert or how many people am I talking to about myo and then how many people are accepting it? These numbers are important, yes, because of your systems and your processes. So you have to understand where in your systems and your processes things are going awry. However, if you are converting and it is consistent, the metrics typically don't matter unless you're trying to scale and improve that number. And as long as that number is not declining, if it is consistent, the metrics really don't matter. Frankly, what are the odds that 100% of people that you meet are going to like you and jive with you? Very low, right? You don't even like 100% of the people that you meet or run into, you know, when you're driving, in the grocery store, in whatever, you get bad vibes about certain people. So already, knock a percentage of people out that will never buy from you no matter what. Then, how many people do you know in your life that you do like, that you are willing to now hand over money to for whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but that you're willing to pay money to. There are people in my life that I like. There are people in my life that I love that I know I'm not trusting you with any sort of money or you're the type who has some sort of crazy scheme going around and I'm never going to see this money again or there's not going to be much benefit for me. You've sold me a lot of Avon in the past and, you know, I really didn't need the Avon. I don't know. So there's always that percentage of people that weren't going to buy from you anyway, no matter what it is you did. So part of your closing or your metrics as to your conversion rate really doesn't make a difference. So don't get too wrapped up in how much you're converting or what percentage of people. If you have conversions and you're consistently, so every week, let's say every week you're getting one or two and you can consistently manage that amount of people because Mayo is long-term. So a lot of you who are doing long-term packages, you can't sign on five people a week every single week. You sign on five people a week, every single week as one individual, you can't service all of them. You don't have appointment times for all of them for nine, 10, 11, 12 months of working with these people. You just don't have the time. You're limited by your time. So one or two, two or three, and you're relatively consistent. Awesome. I don't care that you spoke to 17 people and like only three of them convert each week. Three is probably what you can realistically manage. So stay in your wonderful purview and don't worry about how many people you're talking to. I can guarantee you there were some of them that you were never going to be able to sell anyway because they just don't like you for whatever reason. 
Everybody's not going to like you. Everybody doesn't like me. They're crazy, but not everybody likes me. I'm not for everyone. And that's okay. Cause I don't like everyone either. <laughs> it's mutual. Okay. There's definitely people I would never give money to. So you have to take this all with a grain of salt and just understand that you and who you are needs to show up first and foremost. And so out of the five keys that I'm going to give you, let's start at number five and we'll work our way to number one, the five keys on how you can get patients to accept more. Number one, five is going to be being real. It is of the utmost importance that you are real. At the top of the priority scale, when you look at the recent surveys and data that go on for sales in business, um, and in spe especially in retail business, so not necessarily service businesses, but retail businesses, authenticity, honesty, and integrity always top the scales. So when you are listening to the sales gurus, the people who are really talking about how you can sell and how you can be effective at sales, and I'm telling you, if all you do is spend all of your time listening to people who are talking about airway, you're never going to get better in business, okay? You have to get off of the airway, you know, out of that little bubble of people who are just talking the same nonsense to each other, not that it's nonsense. You understand it's not nonsense, but we all get the industry. We all understand what's going on in the industry. You only need this much of that, but then you need this much of business tactics, okay? When you look at sales, a lot of people might be, you know, doing whatever it is that they think they need to do in order to make the sale and they're highly dependent upon getting the sale and that like connection and that reliance upon getting this sale, that desperation, oh, it seeps through. And if you're not genuine and honest about that, uh, it's going to wind up becoming a thing. It's actually been found that if you are more honest and authentic, like, look, I have a family to support. I have four kids. And, you know, it's, it's always an uphill battle educating everybody about myofunctional therapy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some time today. I'm going to explain this to you. Yes, if you sign up, I do benefit. I am able to continue to support my family. But what I really am interested in is working with you to help you because that is my passion. So I make a profit off of this. Yes, but it's my passion to work with people like you. And then continue on with what you were going to say. I respect that. I respect that loads. Granted, if I'm handing you money, I understand that you're going to benefit from it, right? There's no world where you don't benefit from me handing you money. But where I'm really trying to connect with you is in the honesty. I'm telling you, look, I, I have a family to feed. This is absolutely going to feed my family. I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be real. I don't know everything. So sometimes this is exactly what you're going to get. I don't know. I don't have the right answer. I will find it for you though. I will get the answer for you and we will connect again and we'll be able to chat. Will myofunctional therapy help with your leaky gut? Maybe I don't know that answer. Maybe I don't have something to spit out at the top of my head and say, oh yes, absolutely. Or maybe I do. Maybe I might know more about leaky gut, but then you ask me about irritable bowel syndrome and I'm like, I'll find the answer for that. I don't know everything. I'm still learning. And I would love to go down this journey and learn with you as we are helping you to get to your better quality of life and living and so forth. But don't try to fake it till you make it. Okay. When you fake it till you make it, you're, you're, you're going to wind up with a lot of loss at the end of it. You just cannot have that reliance upon, okay, I'm just going to say what I got to say and do what I got to do in order to get this sale. Okay. So be real. Everybody values it. I think that's one of the most, um, most genuine things that you can do is just be as upfront as possible. I tell people, if you're not going to commit, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money. I don't want that for you. So let me stress to you the importance of the myofunctional therapy. And I say it exactly like this. So here's what is like myofunctional therapy in the best analogy that I can do. Personal training. You go to a gym, you sign up with a personal trainer, you work out with them one day a week, you go home, you sit on your couch the rest of the week. Will you ever get six pack abs? No. You won't. That's not your personal trainer's fault. You really don't need an, 
additional explanation, you understand why exactly you're not going to get six pack abs, right? Because you understand that there's a commitment and there's other things that's involved. So yeah, you went home and you sat on your couch, but what did you eat? right? And what's your stress level like? How are you sleeping? All of these things play a role into whether or not you're going to get six pack abs. So you're just not putting the work in, in this one aspect of things. And that would make signing up with a personal trainer, a waste of time and a waste of money, right? Same thing with myofunctional therapy. It's muscles that are further up in the body. If you're not going to put the work in, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. I don't want to waste either for you. And frankly, I don't have a refund policy that's going to accommodate you wasting your time, your money, and my time. I don't. And so people understand before they sign up with me that that's the real. It's all right there. And I don't take any excuses. There's no excuses. If I've told you this from the jump, you sign up. There's no reason why we're going to now backtrack and be like, oh, but I didn't know it was going to be this, that, and the other. You knew. <laughs> you knew fully, fully well, you knew. So be real, okay? Start off by being real. A lot more people respect that. A lot more people will sign up with you, will agree if they understand in totality that you're always going to be real and genuine and honest with them. There are too many people out here who are lying, who are on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, making their lives look gorgeous and everything's amazing. There's too many people that are lying in our faces every single day, celebrities that are telling us products they use, you know, people who are telling us that they've lost a whole lot of weight on Weight Watchers, but we know that all they're doing is taking Ozempic. I mean, there's enough people lying to us that we don't need more. So be real. Okay. Four, go deep. You have to go deep. And I always say it's three layers deep. Okay. Three layers deep. So there's not one person on this great big planet earth that cares about not one. And uh, this internet, Okay, there's not one person on this great big planet Earth who cares about proper oral resting posture, not a single, single soul, okay? So you might want to educate and overly educate and talk to people until you're blue in the face about the importance of proper oral resting posture and what the tongue does when it goes up against the palate and yada, yada, blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. I'm not spending money for proper oral resting posture. I can figure that out in some way, shape, or form that doesn't involve me spending money with you. We're in the information age, okay? If I want proper oral resting posture, I might happen upon mewing. I might happen upon articles. I might happen upon the Snore Gym app. I might happen upon a number of things that are going to promise me that, that cost significantly less, okay? So what I would say is now you got to dig deep. Proper oral resting posture is not what anybody's going to come to you and spend money for. They're spending money for something else. So the last time I asked somebody about this, you know, they gave me a wonderful story about myofunctional therapy has been so beneficial for them in their life. And um, essentially what it did was it helped them really like get better sleep and, you know, avoid a very costly surgery and so forth and so forth. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. None of that is what you bought in. Not a single bit of that. So what does having better sleep and saving money on whatever that costly surgery was that you were told you needed, but now after Maya, you don't need, what is it that now is your, your why? Like, why? What does that do for you? Well, being able to save more money, I mean, I'm able to like spend on the things that I want to spend on and my sleep has made me a lot more focused at work. And then, you know, so I've been more productive and I love that. Awesome. Great. Productivity, wonderful. Everybody wants productivity. You want to spend money on things you want to spend money on. Let's go a little deeper. What are the things that you would spend that money on? And how does that productivity really help you at work? Well, I've been at this same place, the same office for so long, and I've been kind of stagnant with my career and it's really starting to get to me and I want to go farther in advance and I probably need to be more productive. I need to bring more to the table so that I could get to the next level at my career. And then if I'm able to, you know, save more money or peg, if I make more money by having an advancement in my career, well, now I'm going to be able to go on better vacations and like really enjoy enjoy my, my marriage. I feel so disconnected from my spouse. I'm like, bingo, that's it. That's it right there. Like, that's why you spent the money. You spent the money for the biofunctional therapy 
not for any of that other stuff you started talking about, okay? It's for this stuff. It's for the option to have that better life. It's for that path that was going to get you that better life. You wanted to go on a vacation. Myofunctional therapy is perfect for you because you could save money that'll help you get on that vacation where you can really connect with your spouse. You and your spouse are going to be able to benefit from this together because you are going to be more productive at work. You're going to get a better job. You're going to be able to advance and make more money and enjoy more on that vacation. Maybe you can upgrade your room. You get a swim up suite instead of just like a junior suite. It's going to be phenomenal at the end of this myofunctional therapy. That's worth it. That's worth whatever you're telling me I'm going to spend. I don't care what your myofunctional therapy program costs now. I get to upgrade to a swamp up suite. Like I'm going to be saving that kind of money on a surgery. Yes, absolutely. Sign me up. Better marriage, better job, more fulfilled. And I get a dope vacation out of it. Hello. I don't care what it costs. I'll put it on my credit card. I like let's do this. Okay. You have to go deeper. There's going to be more that they want. That is not that superficial stuff. The less you talk about the superficial, like the proper oral resting posture, their TMD. Yeah, I get oral facial pain. They have issues and all of these things, they do create problems in their life, but what are the problems? And then underneath that, what are the problems under the problems? Because there's something that is a lot deeper. Okay. And once you connect to that, that's going to be the big thing. And so really, it's connecting with yourself so that you can understand how to connect with others. So key number three is absolutely uncovering what was your aha moment. What is your aha moment? For me, I'll tell you about me and my children. And I feel like I may have told some of you about this already, but we'll just keep keep talking about my traumas, okay? As a hygienist in 2014, I was really brought into awareness about myofunctional therapy. This is what myofunctional therapy is. I was working in a practice where there was a pediatric dentist doing ELF, and she was talking to me about all the wonderful stuff. She really took a liking to me. And then eventually when she moved and she left the practice in 2016, you know, I kind of went with her, not really, but I kind of went with her. And she was like, look, you're going to have to really get into all this stuff. In 2015, I had a baby. I completely messed that baby up. Okay. <laughs> I knew all the stuff. 2014, I was pregnant. That doctor was talking to me about all the stuff. She was telling me about everything. I understood. I went to conferences with her all of 2017, 2016 to 2017. I went to conferences with her and I'm really like getting into it. My baby still has a pacifier. My baby was using a sippy cup. Like we were doing all of the things wrong that I shouldn't have been doing with the education that I had. But that was my fourth baby, okay? Fourth. So at that point, I'm like, eh, you know, she's going to be fine because my other three are fine, aren't they? No, they weren't fine. And I still didn't see it. It wasn't like a thing for me. I didn't see whatever it was that I see now with my own eyes. So I didn't see the asymmetries. I didn't see the deficiencies. I didn't see all of the things that are so glaringly obvious to me right now, having the information wasn't enough for me. It took a phenomenal myofunctional therapist, Paula Fabi, to look at my daughter. She, was, she blocked out two hours to do like a comprehensive evaluation with my daughter for myofunctional therapy because she had a tongue tie and, you know, whatever. So I was just going through the motions. Okay. I was like, all right, let's just do this comprehensive evaluation. We spent 10 minutes with Paula. Paula looked at my child. She asked her to do a couple of things. And she said, this child can't breathe. She needed to be at an ENT yesterday. Uh, go get a CBCT and you know take whatever you can to the ENT. But there's nothing I can do. And just kind of just as flippant as it sounds is how it was presented. Like, what? There's nothing you could do? Wait, what? So I start to get a little emotional. She goes, she takes her CBCT. This is my seven-year-old daughter. She's the third child that I have. Okay. So I have four and she's number three. Um, and it turns out 
adenoids, tons, everything's super swollen, super swollen, heavily inflamed, sinuses. She is completely blocked, completely blocked as far as the CBCT shows. Airway is small, like what? How did I not know this? How did Paula, without having the CBCT, without having any data other than looking at her, asked her to do a couple of things and was like, she can't breathe, send her away. <laughs> She's, I can't do anything for her. How did she know that? I'm a hygienist and not only am I a hygienist, I've lived with this child. I have this information in my hands and I've never seen these things on my child. Like what, what am I missing? How did I become this level of a terrible mother? How did I fail my child at this level that I had no idea she couldn't breathe? Of course, we took her to the ENT. We went to Dr. Stephen Park back when he was practicing at Montefiore in uh, Bronx. And, you know, he scoped. And sure enough, she only had 10%. One nostril fully blocked, the other nostril mostly blocked. 10% of space she had for nasal breathing. So, like, who would have known? Who would have known? That was it for me. My aha moment was that I was a bad mom, that I had information. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to use, utilize it. I failed my child and I can't continue to keep failing my child. And if something was wrong with this one, and she's number three out of four, then something's wrong with one, two, and four. Very clearly, I'm failing all of my children as a collective. My aha moment was me as a mom. That was my deep my deep moment, right? So when I connect with parents, I connect with them mostly on the fact that we don't want to be bad parents. We we understand. I think every parent understands that you're going to mess up your kid in some way, shape, or form. This is not going to be the way I mess up my kid by them not being able to breathe, okay? That's not going to be the way I messed him up. They're going to need therapy probably for lots of other stuff. Who knows? Everybody needs therapy. Mental health is incredibly important. But Mm -mm. If I'm going to mess them up, it's going to be without me having known about something that I could have done to prevent them being messed up. So I connect with parents on, you know, you can't feel bad about what you didn't know then. You just have to take the best steps that you can now to ensure that you're setting them on the right path. The right path is what makes you feel good and sleep at night because I couldn't sleep at night knowing my child couldn't breathe. Can you sleep at night if you know your child can't breathe? These are like the real, the deep, the raw conversations that I wind up having with parents on a daily basis where we're now connecting on this very, very, you know, very, I don't know, intimate. I I, I wanted another word, but a very intimate path. So connect with them. What was your aha? What did it for you? Did you have a specific problem? Did you have a niece, a nephew, a, a somebody, a loved one who was experiencing these things and it hurt you somewhere in your soul so much so that now you're investing thousands of dollars into education to become a myofunctional therapist or that you are passionately now making sure that you're educating every patient in your hygiene chair. Like what was it for you that brought you over the line of, I know this thing exists because there's lots of hygienists who understand and who know there's lots of clinicians who understand and know that myofunctional therapy is a thing. What takes you to the next step to start investing in it, to start doing the things for yourself, your family, your loved ones? Connect with your patients. And I'm telling you, you will have better conversations that actually lead to them signing up to work with you. They feel like they intimately know you. And at that moment in time is where you really have that that bond that you really need. I think bond was better than intimacy <laughs> as a word. You have that bond that you really need for that yes, for acceptance. Okay. Key number two, be flexible. I hate the idea and the concept that like, you know, you could just charge whatever and, you know, demographics don't make a difference and yada, yada. Can you afford your myofunctional therapy program or can you afford the local myofunctional therapist program? Like right now, out of pocket, full money, not putting it on your credit card. Like, you know, you have that money in the bank. And you'll still be able to pay your bills comfortably, like whatever. Can you afford you? If you cannot afford you, because I remember very distinctly me like trying to figure out, oh my gosh, 
I just saw Paula Fabi. I just saw Stephen Park. And I have no idea how I'm going to help all four of my children have myofunctional therapy, body work, and appliances. I can't afford that. I'm a registered dental hygienist. I, I'm not making the money that like hygienists are making now. I wasn't making nearly that. I was making at least $20 less an hour than what people are making right now in New Jersey. So if I couldn't afford it then, but that didn't mean I didn't need the help. It meant I needed to be able to still have a roof over my head and to have, you know, uh, food on the table for my children, at least at the very least, I could go hungry. So if that meant that I didn't eat, that'd be fine. I could go hungry, but I would never let my kids go hungry. So if I couldn't afford it, then why would I set barriers to other families, to other people that I couldn't cross over? I had to become a therapist. I was working for a doctor who was doing these um, these appliances and so forth. So I was able to actually benefit from discounts because I work there or the fact that I'm the myofunctional therapist or discounts for the people I refer to for body work. And so I was able to find a way to work the system so it worked for me. What do your patients do when they don't have all of that? I don't agree with let's just charge whatever or, you know, we are invaluable so we can come up with whatever number we want to come up with. I would stay in whatever my demographics tell me I should be in because honestly, if I couldn't afford me, if I couldn't out of pocket say, okay, yes, I'm going to put down X, Y, Z amount of money, then I don't expect other people to. That's it. Yes, they may need it. There's a lot of things we need. I need a bigger house. A bigger house isn't coming to me because I want it. A bigger house isn't coming to me because I can put it on a credit card. That, that's not the way that works. I have four kids. I would love to have like a five, six bedroom house. I've got a four bedroom house. Just because they want something doesn't mean you have to price them out of it. Okay. So be reasonable, be willing to be flexible. I'm flexible all the time. There are some people I've seen some people, there's this one woman I've, I've steeply discounted my services for. She paid full price for her Vivos appliance. And I wasn't happy that she went with Vivos, but she did. Uh, she paid full price for her Vivos appliance. And it's like, I'm really struggling. I have Lyme's disease and a lot of autoimmune issues. And I've struggled my whole life. My palate is only 29 millimeters across molar to molar. And I don't know what to do next. And she's ready to like, cry. She's like, I can't do the body work. I can't find anybody to do my own. Like, I really just don't know what to do next. And I, I just wanted to talk to you because your consult is free. And I said, okay, don't worry. The consult is free. Yes, of course. And I, I don't know what to tell you as far as, you know, what you've already expensed on your Vivos. But what I can tell you is that I'm willing to work with you on what my fees are. So I'll charge you $1,000 flat, like $1,000. That's it. But you have to be committed. You have to be committed 100% of the way. Uh, we're going to take pictures. We're going to do testimonies. We're going to do all sorts of things along the way. But while, when we're working together, it's full commitment. Okay. 100%. And she was on board. I was on board. I felt good about that. It felt good in my soul. That actually wound up with a lot of great karma. So I got a lot of full price people that came after that who weren't able to pay just absolutely out of pocket. Awesome. Wonderful. But being flexible is a superpower. It's an absolute superpower. So if you can't afford you, you need to figure out ways to help other people be able to work with you. So whether that's a payment plan, whether it's breaking it down and then, you know, you're prioritizing them. So you're going to say, okay, we'll do four sessions here, go do expansion, come back to me, and then we'll do more and so forth. However you break it down, however you're going to break it down, be willing to be flexible. The more flexibility you have, the more people are willing to say yes, because they understand that you're going to work with them in some capacity. And if you're working with them, they're willing to work with you you. Okay. Let's take a second um, before we get to number one, because a really big one, number one is here's a myth. Okay. Education is the only way to close the deal. They don't have to be educated. They don't have to be educated. They don't have to understand what myofunctional therapy is. Is they don't have to understand how you're going to do what you're going to do. They just need to know that you're going to be able to solve the problem. So if the problem is 
I would like to be more productive at work. I am not productive enough at work. I am tired all day. I have daytime fatigue. I can't concentrate, you know, whatever. Will you be able to help me? Yes. Awesome. Great. That's enough right there. That's all they needed to close the deal. You are the answer to the problem that they are having. It is not that, okay, yes, uh, proper oral resting posture is going to afford me the ability to improve my vagal tone. And that will also in turn stimulate the nasal floor. The nasal floor is really where I'm going to be helped with producing nitric oxide. All of this is going to help me with my breathing and who cares? No one cares. No one cares. I'm not buying into something because you've educated me about it. A lot of times decisions for buying are very emotional. And then later on, we'll put the logic with it. Okay. There's been a lot of like stupid expensive things like working with certain coaches and doing certain programs and doing this and that where I'm like 12,000. Awesome. Sounds great. Let's do it. Because emotionally, I feel so tied to the message that the person is saying. I feel like they're speaking directly to me, to my soul. They're going to solve my problem. My problem is such and such. They're going to hit the nail right on the head and I'm going to be stupidly successful as a result of working with this person. And then after I've said my yes, I have to look at myself in the mirror and be like, why did I say yes to that? I don't understand why I just spent $12,000 to work with so-and-so. Like, I really don't understand it. I feel like there's so many other ways I could have done this thing. Uh, but then you later on, you will put the logic to it, right? It happens a lot. When we're in the grocery store, Easiest example, you're in the grocery store, you're a little hungry, it really sounds good to buy those cookies. And look, ooh, they're on sale. Okay, we're gonna get the cookies. No harm, no foul. We'll get the cookies and then we'll bring them home and then we're gonna eat them and we're gonna feel good about it. And then you get the cookies and you bring them home and then you wind up eating a row of cookies and you're like, what am I doing with my life? Why did I buy that thing? Like, wh where in what world did I decide it was great for me to have cookies today, knowing very well my cholesterol is high or whatever? Or I'm trying to lose weight or this, that, and the other. We buy from emotion, not necessarily the logic. We'll justify it later logic, logistically, right? So we might say, okay, I bought the cookies because I was kind of hungry and I was in a little bit of a mood. Next time I go to the store, I'm going tunnel vision. Do not go down the cookie aisle because I know I don't need those cookies. Like, why am I getting cookies? We're going to not go down the cookie aisle. I don't care what's on sale down that aisle. Avoid at all costs. I'm going in with a list and I'm just going to get what I need. Awesome. Logic kicks in always afterwards. We do a lot of emotional buying. So emotion really funds a lot of what we do. And connected to emotion is getting that win, okay? Getting a win. Because I'll tell you that education is readily available everywhere. Most of you on this call probably have a set list of books, reading, research, or articles that you direct people to, and they can get all the information in the world from that. There's nothing new or magical that you're going to tell them that they can't find in James Nestor's Breath or in Jaws or in such and such. Like there's so many books, there's so much research, there's podcasts, there's things all over. Information is free. Information is readily available all over, everywhere you go. A lot of those books are available in the library. Podcasts are absolutely free, minus the torture of having to listen to commercials. But Everything can be sourced at the touch of a couple of finger taps on a keyboard, okay? So you don't have to educate people in order for them to feel like they need to work with you because they understand this thing so much better. In fact, you might just talk them out of it, okay? more education you provide, the more I'm feeling like, mm, I'm going to go Google this later and I'm going to figure out if I really need this because it's sounding like you have to work too hard to convince me that I need this, right? For three years, that didn't work for me. I had a baby in between there that I could really influence the trajectory of her growth. And mm, nope, for three years, having information didn't work for me. Like I, I fully understand that concept, that frame of mind that if this was really important information, I would also be able to source it on my own. So I don't need you for a, a education. Okay. So 
information is free, but what's not are the wins, those little daily wins that you could get that people sometimes don't get from other sources, right? So what do you get when you read Gasp? You might get a little tip here and there. I don't know. You, you get like a little bit of something, right? Mostly it's information though. What do you get when you're talking to your clinician who you know, like, and trust already? But what do you get when you're talking to your clinician? And in talking to that clinician, you're able to now connect with them. And then they give you the tip about nasal hygiene and the benefits of using a saline that has xylitol in it. And you go home and you, well, let's say you didn't even go home yet. You add it right there in your smart phone, you add it to your Amazon cart, it's coming tomorrow, you get it, you start using it, you feel good. You feel really good. You got a small win. And you're like, Ooh, I got to call her. Let me call her back. I need to know where I can do more. How can I do more? What's the next step from here? They were talking to me about Mayo. what? That's it. That right there, providing a win is the key. Okay. A lot of things that you see that are out there now are all to provide you a win. So when you see challenges, right, all of this information that you're getting from me, like every week, 11 weeks, I've been going live, providing you with win after win after win. At some point in time, you're gonna be like, hey, Carice, I have a question. And that's where my schedule gets filled up with meeting all of you guys. And then we're able to talk and, and we can really connect at that point to where we are now going to go beyond just this information and these wins that you can get from here and move into, okay, so what's your next level? How can I help you get better at what you're doing, right? So when you see challenges, when you see sometimes even books, people who write books, they're not writing books just because they want to be an author. Most books are self-published these days. A lot of people are skipping that whole process of getting the publisher. They're just going straight to, I'm going to have a book. And in that book, people are going to see me as an authority. I'm going to provide them with tips and tricks. And those tips and tricks are going to lead them directly to me and my services, right? People who go on podcasts. I've done over 85 podcasts at this point. I recorded two today. Um, these podcasts now, every time I want a podcast, they want to know what's a tip, what's a trick, show us an exercise, show us this, do that. Awesome. I will give you a little win. And then once that little win, it's kind of like having the uh, worm on the hook. And then the fish is going to come get the worm on the hook. They're hooked. And now you could reel them in, reel them up. And now you get what's next from there. So if I'm on a podcast, typically it's talking to the general public. So then it would be, okay, their next step, they got that little win. They're going to go now and book a free consultation. That free consultation leads them to talking with me. And then we're going to go through the whole cycle. Okay. I get real. I go deep. I connect. I'm very, very flexible. I'm probably the most flexible, um, my functional therapist you've ever met. Cause I'm like, oh, you don't have any money. No worries. We'll figure it out. <laughs> It's very flippant because I enjoy what I do, but I really enjoy working with therapists more so than I enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with clients. So I'm super happy to just like be giving of myself in all sorts of ways. So be flexible. But overall, providing that win is going to be the key. That's where you're really going to sink in on a lot of your patients and get them to, to finally say, you know what? I understand. I understand. It's got to be that thing, right? That CBCT, that was the win when Paula said I needed to take the kids who an ENT yesterday. We did the CBCT after and I saw the evidence of such. Whoa, that was my win there. I understood there in that moment. I, I knew she actually technically set me up as like an alley-oop into becoming a myofunctional therapist. So where I am now, I owe all to, you know, that pediatric dentist, Naomi Hillel, and to Paula Fabi, all of their collective trying to rack it into my brain is absolutely why I'm here, right? So provide a win, get a win for your patients. They will appreciate that much more and far longer than they will information. We've only got but so much room for information, but anybody who's giving me a win, I guarantee you I remember their name and I know where I'm going when it's time for me to spend or I'm ready to get to the next step, okay? 
it's not about, I love this quote with Mark Hunter, uh, it's not about having the right opportunities, it's about handling the opportunities, right? You have opportunities every day if you're in clinical dentistry. I would live for that. I don't want to do clinical hygiene at all in any capacity, but I would live for the opportunity to be in front of people all the time looking at this stuff, able to talk to them and to really like dive deep into my story and how I got into this or what their traumas are, whether it be from their youth or what they're experiencing now. So have the right opportunities in front of you do what you can to claim them, okay? It doesn't have to be a total loss. You can master the marketing. So with 10 minutes left, I'm happy to answer any questions. Just pop them in the chat. But if you do have something that you want to talk about because you're like, I need to get to the next step. I feel like something is missing. Uh, you don't know what it is. I am happy to chat with you. How can you get this in your practice? How can you improve and get better at whatever it is, whether it's communicating or talking to patients. I don't have a course for any of that, honestly. I really do just talk to people for most of my day, uh, putting in a lot of goodwill, hoping that, you know, the Lord blesses me with goodwill output. But let's chat, okay? That is my my um, link, my scheduling link. <laughs> just put that into your email browser, https bit.ly, so B-I-T period L-Y slash chat with Carice and my scheduling link will pop up and you'll be able to book an appointment with me. I don't see any messages in the chat. So I'm going to assume I could kind of dip out a little early. Um, it was such a pleasure to be here with you guys. Everything, every single week is inspired by the questions or the things that come up when I'm in chats with you guys. And I plan on going live every single week to continue to offer value. So please reach out. I'm happy to chat with you at any moment in time. Thanks for joining me, whether you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. I appreciate you all. Mwah. Have a great, great evening and a great week. I'll see you next time.